right, everybody hear me okay? Um, thanks for coming. So this is the first time I've given this talk at a talk at a DevOps conference before, so hopefully you all don't run me out of here afterwards being like, ah, that serverless guy, that's BS. Um, so the title of this talk was Full Stack Service at Scale. Um, I'm Steve Faulkner, at South Pole Steve on Twitter, on GitHub, on pretty much anywhere else on the internet. Um, the reason for that is I, I worked at the South Pole once, um, but that's like a whole nother talk, and if you want to grab a beer later and talk about it, we can. I came out here all the way from Philly, land of cheesesteaks and Rocky. Um, that's where I'm based out of, and then I work in New York often. Uh, I am the director of platform engineering at Bustle. So Bustle um, basically means I'm kind of in charge of all things back end. Uh, Bustle, for those of you not familiar, um, is a online women's media publication. So um, not like a ton of women in the audience, but you know, most, uh, most guys I've met at conferences have rarely heard of it. But it's very big. We get about 40 million unique visitors a month, um, depending on whose numbers you believe on like Comscore and Alexa, it puts us somewhere in the top 30 in the US for websites, so it's pretty big. Um, it's a great place, I love working there. Um, and this talk is really more, I, I, the title I submitted, I, didn't, I decided later I didn't like that much. So it's really like the Hitchhiker's Guide to Serverless. So um, I'm gonna talk about these things during the course of this talk. This is the, the general arc. Um, so I'm talking about the hype, all right? Everybody's like, you know, serverless, 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 there's all this hype about it, so I'm gonna address that. I'm gonna go through kind of just serverless 101, when people talk about serverless, what are they actually talking about? Like, what does it look like under the hood? Um, I'm gonna talk about why you might use it, why you might not use it. I'll talk about how we use it at Bustle, and lastly, I'm gonna talk about tooling, so, which is my favorite part. Okay, so, serverless, the hype train. Um, it's already, uh, this Medium post was posted in March, so like already March, it was called the buzzword of 2016. Um, all these people are writing all these things on Medium about it, and I don't know, there's, uh, some people don't like it. Um, this was a couple weeks ago. Somebody said that serverless is a poor choice for 99% of startups. I disagree with this. Um, this was just, I think, last week on Hacker News. I hate when people read off slides, but I'm just gonna do it anyways, because I can make an excuse for myself. Uh, the people who are serving websites on Lambda or something are not only doing it wrong, they are wasting money while locking themselves into an architecture that does not fit their app. So my first thought on reading this was that I should probably try to hire this guy because he knows more about my app than I do. So, um, also very much disagree with this. So, serverless. All right, so first gonna talk about really like, in 2016 today, when somebody uses the word serverless, what are they actually talking about? Because the, the term's been around for a while. It's not really a new term. I would, you know, kind of looked back and there's mentions of it back in 2010 um, relative to other technologies. So, you know, what does it mean today? Uh, backend as a service is one thing people can mean. They mean things like Firebase, uh, Parse, Heroku. Um, in 2016, serverless does not mean these things and this talk is not about those things. Uh, maybe the fact that one of these doesn't exist is some like indication of why. Um, but this is kind of like when people talk about serverless sometimes, they mean these things, but that's not what I would interpret as like the modern, uh, modern meaning of serverless. Uh, really what I think it's about and what I, when I just talk about serverless is functions as a service. Um, so functions as a service is a really pretty simple concept. Instead of buying servers, you're actually just buying individual runs of functions. Um, you know, the kind of tenants are run my code only when I actually need you to run it. Don't be running it all the time. Uh, I only want to pay for when that code is actually running, and just don't bother me with any of the details. Um, turns out, I think this is actually pretty good, uh, matches up pretty well with web programming. I mean, doing some hand waving and ignoring some edge cases, web programming is really uh, a request and response cycle. That's what HTTP is, that's what the protocol is, and so um, being able to have a function in the middle of that that is your app running code is kind of, you know, if I can only pay when it is actually doing things, that's really great. Um, for those of us in the node, I'm a, I'm a node guy, so for those of us in the node land, we kind of actualize this because everything's, you know, with Express, it's functions, right? That's how it works. So people that are actually doing this, like say you wanna run these functions as a service, um, Microsoft has a product, I believe it's in beta, I believe Google Cloud Platforms is also in beta. Um, IBM has this cool thing called OpenWhisk that is actually an open source uh, Python based kind of functions as a service layer so you could run on your own infrastructure. For me that kind of defeats the purpose of serverless a little bit but I think 
from a you know community standpoint, it's really interesting to see how other people are doing it. Um, this talk is not about any of those things. Um, this talk is actually about AWS. So uh, some people, maybe who work for those other companies, might be in the audience and disagree with me. But basically, I think everybody's pretty far behind AWS on this stuff, um, like very, very far behind. And I found this to be the case when I actually talk to people about this stuff. I go to these conferences, you know, have conversations, and I would say 95% of the time when we're talking about functions as a service, we're talking about AWS Lambda. Um, it's okay to disagree with me about that, but that's you know, kind of what the focus of this talk is gonna be, and, and that's what we use at Bustle. So Amazon actually has two products that kind of combine together to um, make serverless their work. So I talked about functions as a service, but they also have a routing layer called API Gateway, um, because you really need both, right? You, you have functions that you need to run, but you need something that routes requests to those functions. Um, so those are the two, two tools that they have. I'm gonna talk about each of them just kind of very briefly and, and how, some of they work, how some of the things work and why they're interesting. Um, and then I'm gonna get more into some of the other stuff. So Lambda first. Uh, Lambda is the functions as a service part. Uh, this is a screenshot of what the Lambda UI console thing looks like. There's nothing really that important here, just like if you see this, you're in the right place. Um, and it's really actually a very, very simple model. So you write some code, you zip it, you upload it, and you can actually just upload it right through the UI, and then you click like test, and it'll just run that code. Um, you can run it, uh, first class support for Node, Java, and Python. Uh, with a node shim, you can then run kind of any compiled language, which is kind of cool. I know there's a bunch of cool people doing stuff with Go uh, and Haskell um, with AWS Lambda. There's a little bit of an overhead there, though, so something to be aware of. Uh, the first thing before anybody's used Lambda is they always kind of freak out at me, and they're like, ah, there's going to be all this weird Amazon stuff I'm going to have to know. And the code you actually write is very, um, very kind of abstract from Amazon. There's not a lot of Amazon-specific stuff. This is probably the simplest node, hello world, Lambda function you could write. An event comes in, it's got some information, whether it's a user request or something else happened. Context, I'm gonna hand wait over, the, over that, just don't worry about it. Um, and callback, which is just a node style callback, error and a response. So Lambda is, you know, just does this basic thing, but on top of that, it gives you all this other awesome stuff. So um, that's what this stuff is, and this is gonna be important to you later when you're actually trying to run this stuff in production. So versioning, you can actually version your functions, they're immutable. Uh, you can then alias those versions, so you can have like version five of my function is the beta version or the beta alias, and you can redirect those, so you can basically say, now I want version six to be the beta version. Um, you can select how much RAM and CPU is allocated to your function. You actually select the RAM, like in a dropdown, um, or via your API calls, and CPU is actually tied to that, so that's something that's super well documented, but they're tied together, so if you're running out of CPU, you might also need to just bump the RAM. Uh, you get a bunch of logging stuff, goes to CloudWatch, um, and then you can also have these Lambda functions be triggered from all different things. So I'm gonna talk a lot about user requests as triggering Lambda functions, but you can do DynamoDB updates, S3 updates, uh, Kinesis streams, there's a bunch of them on there, and it's kind of super handy. Okay, second part, API gateway. So this is what the API gateway UI looks like. A little more complicated, there's more going on here. Uh, the way to use API Gateway is that you just click around a lot. Um, it, uh, I'm gonna talk, talk about maybe how to alleviate some of this later, but if, I highly recommend it if you've never done any of this before and you want to try this, like go try to deploy by hand through the UI one Lambda function and one API Gateway project and you'll see what I'm talking about and you'll, no, it's not gonna be a lot of fun. So there's a lot of UI elements that evolve API Gateway. Um, I'm gonna not really talk about the details there. But just like um, Lambda, you know, kind of just simply just run this function, and API Gateway is just a simple router. You basically have a request come in at a URL and you can point it to some backend. It doesn't have to be Lambda. It can be your own backend. It can be a third party backend. Um, you can do, it's, you know, just like a layer that would sit in front of some backend somewhere. Uh, on top of that, you get all this other good stuff that is kind of API level concern stuff that you're probably gonna want caching and throttling of requests, um, authorization, you can basically link API Gateway up to IAM roles, so if you're already kind of bought into the Amazon like IAM or Cognito system, then super nice. Uh, you can provision API keys, you can set up different stages. Stages are basically like environments, so you have a beta function and that is linked up to a beta API Gateway stage. Uh, logging metrics all go to CloudWatch. Custom domains, obviously super important. 
Uh, SSL may be both good and bad, depending on your needs. So SSL is a requirement of API Gateway, and it's all the new, um, you know, like latest TLS, SNI stuff. So if you've got some uh, thing running on, either you can't use SSL or it's like really old SSL stuff, uh, then you're gonna have a bad time. There's also Swagger import and export. So I'm gonna talk a little more maybe about that later, but uh, that is a kind of somewhat recent addition and makes everything way better and less clicking around, but still a little bit clicking around. Uh, lastly, you need to have these thing, two things talk to each other, and they mostly do when you just do all the clicking around, um, but there's a, a number of different little gotchas, and so, spoiler alert, I'm gonna talk about that later in tooling. Uh, okay, so like third part of the talk, so why? Why would we actually do this? So we've got these tools, like, are they, are they actually any good? Um, so I hesitated to put this in, this in the deck here, but I, don't, I love this tweet, I think it's like a great tweet. Um, so, you know, these things are things I use, right? But I don't, I don't care about any of these things, right? Like these are tools that help me get to some goal. Like these are the things that I care about. Like these are the things that I want my team to care about, right? Like, you know, so, Anytime I'm looking at a technology, I'm always, you know, I'm thinking about these things. I'm not thinking, oh, wow, this is like a cool new thing. So with that in mind, trying to care about these things, um, let's address some of the kind of like, you know, what's cool about serverless and Lambda and API Gateway and what, why you might want to use it. So ops is one. This is kind of probably like the biggest one people worry about, especially like an ops conference. Um, you know, everybody's worried about like, well, does this mean ops goes away? Like, what happens? So before I... Uh, at the job I am now, I helped co-found this music startup, and this is this is like kind of Ruby code because I was writing Ruby in like 2010. Um, but this was like ops, right? <laughs> it was like for me, it was like, oh well, Heroku's down. I guess we'll just go do something else today. Um, and then you know I started working at not startups, and even the startup itself got bigger. And so you know you have a plan, right? Like that's what ops is. We need to figure out what's going to happen when things break. Um, and I think everybody seems to think that. This is what serverless means because the word is serverless, right? And then we're all sitting around like just laughing about, ah, oh, there's no servers, this is hilarious, we don't worry about any of that stuff anymore, and it's just not true, right? Like it's not how this stuff works. Um, there are still servers, I still think about them every day. Um, in serverless ops world, we still have to have a plan. So it's just kind of we do different things than we did before, and maybe we do like a little less of them too. Um, you know, I still spend a lot of time benchmarking Lambda and API Gateway. I worry about fallbacks. We try to figure out, okay, when Lambda goes down, can we hack API Gateway to read static content out of S3 or serve up nice error pages or do stuff like that. Do a ton of like load testing. Um, maybe we do a little bless ops. Uh, this is still something I'm trying to like quantify. I, and I haven't really gotten a good handle about it yet. I think very uh, qualitatively, I feel like my team worries about, you know, ops related things less as a whole, but we definitely still worry about them. Um, and part of that I'm gonna get into tooling. We gotta make better tooling. Ops related, but scale. So this is like another thing that kind of is the, around serverless that gets a lot of buzz. Is like, oh, you can just, it infinitely scales and you don't have to worry about it. Um, which is not really true. I mean, at some point it's not gonna work for some scale. Uh, I have this analogy that I really like to use for programming. It's like my favorite programming analogy, so I hope you all indulge me for a second. Um, Imagine that you have to write your name on a piece of paper. You're like, okay, that's not bad, I can do that. Imagine I say you have to write it 100 times on that same piece of paper, and you're like, well, okay, that's gonna suck, but I could do it. Now imagine I say you have to write your name a million times on that piece of paper. And you're like, well, crap, I don't have enough paper, I might run out of ink in my pen, where's the nearest pen store, do I have to bike there, do I know how to ride a bike? Like, that's what happens at scale, right? Every time you at inflection points in scale, you end up suddenly potentially having to do things completely different than you were doing them before. Um, you know, I think this analogy for me applies to everything from ops to uh, you know, even UI elements, right? We're gonna use a table for this, and then what happens when that table gets to be too many elements? Well, now it just looks crappy, right? What are we gonna do differently? Um, and I think for me, the biggest point for serverless so far has been, you know, Lambda and API Gateway has been less changes, right? There's less stuff that I have to do differently between one request per second and a thousand requests per second. So it doesn't keep me up as night at much. I'm less worried about what is actually gonna happen when we push this thing to production. Um, the best example that I have of this, I'm gonna try to like punctuate this with like real world examples of stuff we've done. 
This is a, a, an error or a throttled read request from Dynamo log. So we're throttling about 4,000 requests a minute. Um, so I came into work one day and everything was broken. And I was like, ah, crap. So I'm starting to look at their logs and figure out what's going on and I, I figure out this is a problem. So I'm like, okay, bump Dynamo, solve that problem. I'm like, what, how, how did this happen? Like, how did we get to this point in the first place? So I'm looking around and I realized one of our engineers had pushed an API to production that I didn't know had been pushed to production. And so that's what ended up falling through and causing this. And I was like, okay, well, this is like a minus in the serverless column because Dynamo failed to auto scale, doesn't have auto scaling, FYI. Um, but I was like, oh, our API gateway and Lambda endpoint just like basically went to production workload like for the last three days and I had no idea. I was like, okay, like bad on me, like I need to be better at my job. But I was like, it's cool that those technologies actually worked, right? Like it's cool that all these things happened and there was no, you know, massive outage or didn't have to worry about provisioning a bunch more machines or doing weird auto scaling stuff with EC2, it's cool. So to give you a sense of what we're actually doing at Bustle, um, we do about 10 to 20 million events through Lambda a day. Uh, we're about to push finally kind of our, our largest main property over to serving up through API Gateway and Lambda and I'm thinking this will go to maybe like 20 to 30 to 40, somewhere in there. Um, depends on how good I get the caching tuned. Um, and that's all kind of like with, you know, one second deploys. Basically, when you do these things with Lambda and API Gateway, I mentioned the aliases and the versioning. So you can basically publish, you know, so we have like 150 Lambda functions. So you can publish a new version of every single function and wait until they're all done and you're sure that they're already published and then you can execute an API request to publish a new uh, alias for every single one at the same time. So you basically can wait until everything's like staged, ready to go, and then you can just deploy all at once and do it in parallel and it's kind of super nice. Um, I love, you know, I talked about shipping and happiness and I love that my engineers can ship any time, any of the day on their own. No, you know, don't have to wait for something to happen or wait for some release cycle or anything like that. So let's talk about money. Uh, this wasn't on my list of things I care about because just like in my day to day, my, in my job, I don't particularly care about it that much, um, but somebody above me does and that impacts my happiness. So uh, let's talk about money. Um, so the one thing that I think people get freak out about is like, oh, Lambda, is it, is it more expensive? Is it less expensive? And if you run some, if you run the back of the napkin calculations on like a perfectly, you know, provisioned EC2 instance running like an express server, you'll find that Lambda is actually like pr significantly more expensive, right? Like two to five times more expensive. Um, how many people in here have every single EC2 instance always at maximum capacity every single moment of every single day? Like nobody. <laughs> All right, so like that's not the real world, right? And, and, and we were worried about this. We were like, is this stuff gonna be more expensive? Um, so one of the best examples I have, this is a service that was in Node that we just literally copied and pasted it over into Lambda. Um, I hate when people give examples of when they rewrite things sometimes because they're like, oh, we rewrote it, and by the way, we use a different language and we removed a feature, and it's hard to make apples to apples comparisons, but I feel like this one is. EC2 is costing us about $2,500 a month. Um, and then we moved it over to Lambda and API Gateway, went about to about $400 a month. So um, one data point, uh, about a 5x reduction. I think if I had to, you know, if I was forced to put numbers on it, I think some of our other services are like 10 to 50 times cheaper on Lambda. Um, but like I said, then we rewrote it in a different language or we, you know, uh, removed some features or split it up or whatever. <laughs> so I don't want to like say those exact numbers. Um, okay. So why not? Like, I'm not gonna come here and try to tell you that like Lambda and API Gate were like the most amazing things ever and you should use them for everything. I think they're pretty awesome. I would use them for lots of things, but there's some stuff that you should be aware of. Lock-ins, probably like the first thing people say is they're like, ah, no, I'm gonna be locked into AWS. Um, so I think number one, lock-in is, is a general concern. You need to like very, think very hard about if that, if lock-in is something your business is very worried about. For Bustle, we are not. We love that we use AWS for everything. We love we are not their biggest customer. We love lots of stuff about AWS, so I'm cool with being all in on Amazon. That said, you're just writing functions, right? All this is is functions that are, you know, going into containers somewhere behind the scenes. Um, and so taking those functions out of Lambda, if you're just using them for that purpose, is fairly easy. Um, I just wrote this up. This is like if you were gonna take a Lambda function and serve it up through Express, this is all the code you would need. If somebody ever gets locked into Amazon and they like want to email me, I'll just send them this code. So happy to do that. 
um, cold functions. So this is uh, one that I think, especially if you are a Java person, you or might freak out in a minute on the next slide. But um, cold functions, when you're calling your function first, first time, it's not necessarily guaranteed that it's you know sitting in a container ready to go, all warmed up, that anything outside of the handler has actually executed, maybe established in a database connection. So depending on how much stuff you're trying to do, uh, this can add overhead. I've seen it be from anywhere from 100 milliseconds to one to two seconds. Uh, definitely a problem. You can do stuff like by pre-warming your functions. Um, we have some stuff that does that. If your functions get called a lot like ours do, then it's not really a problem. Your functions will basically also get restarted every three and a half hours, kind of by default. Um, just however Amazon is working the magic behind the scenes with their containers, they're actually just rotating those out of production every three and a half hours. Uh, so if you're a JVM person, like I said, you're like, ah, like, I don't know about that. Um, long running tasks. So the max uh, is six minutes on Lambda currently, so this is definitely, oh my gosh, I only have five minutes left. Um, six minutes max is uh, definitely an issue for some people for how much you know, processing you need to do. I was kind of worried about this at first, and then the worst case scenario we had at Bustle was every night we have to read in this three gigabyte S file off of S3, we process it through Lambda, it goes to Kinesis Firehose, and it goes into Elasticsearch. And I was like, ah, oh, man, we're not gonna be able to use Lambda for this, this is gonna be a bummer. And then when I tried to do it, it came in at like five minutes, 20 seconds. So um, as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, okay, maybe it's not such a big deal. Testing. So um, testing is still an issue. Uh, you can unit test the functions pretty easy because they're just node functions or whatever other language. Um, not that difficult of a thing to do. Doing integration testing across all of it is definitely a pain point right now. It's something with the tooling I'm trying to work on actively. Um, the kind of official AWS like line on this is you should just test in the cloud. I was pretty anti this at first, but I'm not gonna lie, I've, I've kind of been proven wrong. Um, it's pretty easy to just spin up like a development or a test kind of environment with a bunch of functions in the cloud and just do it all there. Um, I still don't like it necessarily, but it actually like works pretty decent. Uh, lastly, SSL, like I said, you kind of need to use SSL for all this stuff, otherwise it's not gonna work at all. Serverless at Bustle. Um, so at Bustle, uh, our architecture, like I said, we've kind of basically over the last year moved everything over to API Gateway and Lambda. Um, on the front end, we're actually serving up um, sites that are actually server-side rendered with Lambda and served up through API Gateway. This is Romper, it's a sub-site we have that's targeted at millennial moms, and it is a Riot JS app. It's served uh, HTML and JS through API Gateway, server-side rendered through Lambda, and then we serve a bunch of static content through S3 as well. Um, we're about to move our main site over to that same architecture, um, but though, though not with Riot. On the back end, um, we basically, our architecture is set up so that we have two um, separate uh, kind of APIs, we have our read-write APIs, which are all authenticated. Those are just kind of normal REST APIs. And then we have a GraphQL API that does all of our cached read endpoints. And so both of those are done all through uh, AWS Lambda. This is an example of the GraphQL uh, endpoint. So JSON served up through API Gateway and Lambda. On the back end, we talked to Dynamo, and then we talked to Redis a lot, too. We're big Redis fans. Um, that's kind of generally how our architecture works. Um, Happy to go into that more detail later if people have questions. Tooling, all right. So it's like the most important part of the talk. Everybody needs to like pay attention right now. Um, tooling, I think like right now is like the biggest pain point in the serverless world. And so um, I'm gonna talk about some of the tooling that's available. Uh, there's this thing called the serverless framework. It used to be called JAWS. When we first started doing this, it was called JAWS and they recently renamed it. Um, if I have to give an emoji reaction to that, it would be like shifty eyes. It'd be like naming your framework the microservices framework in like 2012, like, like you don't own the term, you know, like not cool. Um, but it's actually like a pretty decent product, so check it out, it supports all the different runtimes. Um, Node Lambda is JS only, but also decent. Uh, Apex is written by TJ Halichuk, he writes really good code, and it's written in Go, but supports all the runtimes, uh, uses Terraform, basically makes it really easy to do all this stuff. And lastly, there's a project called Sparta that is written in Go for Go, only, and um, I played with that a little bit, it's also cool. So if you're a Go person, I would check out Sparta. But, you could just use the one I wrote. Um, so we have this tool at Bustle called Shep. Um, it used to be called Shepard, but then everybody just called it, kept calling it Shep, so we changed it to Shep. 
Um, it's open source, it's available now, um, it's kind of in beta as we're, we use it in production for everything, but we're just trying to flush out some of the docs and you know, make it not terrible for people that don't work at Bustle. Um, NPM, it's available. Um, the pitches, it's JavaScript only, uh, that's what we do, and so we think we can build kind of the best tool for just JavaScript APIs without having to support the other uh, runtimes. No CloudFormation or Terraform, and I don't think those are bad tools, I just don't like how long they take to deploy things. And so by talking to the AWS APIs directly, then I think we can get those one second deploys, so that's my goal. Swagger import and export um, helps, packages all your functions through Webpack, um, which somebody in here is probably like, oh my gosh, Webpack, that's like a front end thing, but it turns out it's really nice for packaging server side code as well, trying to figure out exactly the minimum build you need to get into a function container. Uh, helps support environments, like I talked about, the alias and the versioning, uh, beta, production, setting up test environments. Lastly, there's this thing called mapping templates. Um, if you use API Gateway manually, you'll run really quick into this thing, part of API Gateway called mapping templates, where you write these Java velocity templates in order to transform requests. It's not fun, don't do it. Um, Basically, if you use Shep or even some of these other tools, almost all the tools completely abstract away mapping templates. They give you a generic one that does kind of everything you would want and gives you a request in like a nice formatted object. So um, we do that as well. The end goal and where I'm trying to get to is literally I want to be able to do Shep new, my API, Shep generate endpoint, and then Shep deploy production. Um, so that's kind of where I'm headed with it and that's the simplicity I want out of this tooling. Uh, it's open source, it's on GitHub, check it out, ask me any questions about it, it's called Shep. Um, all right, my time is up. Lastly, we're hiring at Bustle. Um, I said I'm from Philly, if you're ever in Philly, just look me up, I like work from coffee shops every day, so come hang out with me and argue about JavaScript. Uh, and that's it, I'm Steve, so any questions? So the question is what are we gonna do when we have to increase the, uh, we run out of, like we hit that six minute max? Panic, I don't know. <laughs> like, we, uh, what was the we, thing about planning? Yeah, planning. No, no, like, I mean we have, um, I mean we, we have plenty of, you know, like all of our previous stuff is hosted through OpsWorks on Rails. Like we have plenty of kind of depth on our team in order to do things like if we kind of need to do them that way. And so I'm sure we'll just kind of jump back into that realm. Um, I definitely, Will any problem that I look at now though, I'm like how can I split this up into like smaller lambda functions so I can run it in parallel or do different things. But you know, it's not gonna be perfect for every case. You're talking about monitoring and maintaining the lambda functions themselves? Um, yeah, so we've kind of, you know, like I didn't really talk a lot about Dynamo. We've started, you know, back end wise, data wise, we started moving a lot more stuff over to Dynamo or using the hosted Elastic Cache Redis instances from Amazon. Uh, we definitely, I mean we still have like 50 EC2 instances running, so I, I wouldn't say that we're like totally off it yet, but every day, try to shut down like one more, so. Uh, the question is debugging Lambda and how is it going for us, and it's going terrible is what's happening. Um, so it's, it's definitely a big issue. Um, with Shep, I'm working on some like uh, things to help sort through CloudWatch logs a little bit better and get more visibility into what's happening. Um, I mentioned uh, Eric from IOPipe. IOPipe is a tech stars company in New York that is basically building better metrics for Lambda. That's like their whole pitch. Um, they just got going, but we're already using them, um, trying to you know, get third party providers help with that. It, it's, it is a bummer. Like I think Sumo Logic um, has a, a decent product that we've kind of played with a little bit. Uh, but like, you know, New Relic, who we were using before for everything, you know, they want a server-based model for pricing, and you know, when you look at them and talk about Lambda, they're like, wait, what, you know, like, so. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a missing, it's an opportunity, definitely, for a lot of different companies right now to step up and do better metrics and logging around Lambda and debugging. Um, I could tell you that I don't just like sometimes have to page through the CloudWatch logs myself, but that would be a lie. So it's not that super fun. Yeah, I mean, we, I wouldn't say we're not any, under any cost pressure. I think we, we're, we're better than probably most people are. Um, you know, like our bustle's growing very rapidly and stuff's going really well, so we don't, we don't feel a ton of it. Um, you know, the, so the question is, you know, what, what would I recommend? I think for me, the other products are still so far behind that I just don't know if I could use them, and that might change. I mean, I think they're all, they all know how far behind they are, and so they're all rushing to catch up. 
So hopefully we're gonna see more, you know, that's gonna bring, those costs will be lower and it's gonna bring down Amazon's costs. Um, I'm hoping Lambda's gonna become, you know, what happened with S3 where just like every once in a while we see a, a decrease. Um, you know, that said, I think that you just gotta figure it into everything else you're doing. Like if you have a full-time DevOps person and you don't need a full-time DevOps person anymore, right? Um, you know, like that's, that's money, right? You pay that person. Um, you know, we've definitely, we had a contract, we were working, working with contractors already for that stuff, um, but I know people that have switched from using full-time DevOps into using like a contracting service. Um, so, you know, I think it's kind of it's very specific to your business case. For us, we save so much money because we are a content site, we're a media company, we have tons of viral articles, and we, so we see traffic that goes like this. Exactly, this is very true. So for us, it works out very well. All right, cool. Well, thank you very much for coming. Oh, wait, sorry. All right, thanks.